Thank you. And thanks, thanks everybody for being here. This is a wonderful turnout. It's great so far. Joe Burns, if you're still in the room, thank you very much. I worked with Joe doing absentee ballot counting and things and for years. Uh, it's a great, great resource. I am privileged today to introduce somebody who re reinstills the, the whole theory that millennials aren't a lost cause. Uh, Morgan Zegers, she's the founder of Young Americans Against Socialism, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that enlightens young Americans to the dangers of socialism uh, using social media. Uh, Morgan is also the owner of Zegers Freedom, Freedom Flies, which is a small woodworking company uh, business that creates and sells handcrafted wooden American flags across the country. By the way, for those of us who are old folks, she's a kid. No. And I don't say that, I don't say that in a demeaning way. It's I am so impressed by this young person who's got so much energy, so much intelligence, and so much drive to actually do things. And there's a number of you out there, but I'm an old guy, so you have to forgive me, or, or not. Um, Morgan also ran for Congress on the Republican conservative line for the 113th Assembly District, running on the platform of transparency, imagine that, lower taxes, uh, support local and business uh, uh, taxes, and counter Go Governor Cuomo's radical um, corrupt, uh, corrupt administration, by the way, he is corrupt. Yeah. And by the, the other thing that she was supporting during that whole thing, term limits, which strikes to everything that all of us believe in. Morgan has appeared on Fox News, Fox Nation, BBC World News, CNN, uh, Vice News and other discussions uh, uh, supporting uh, to support socialism in her generation and engaging in young women in politics. She's a frequent speaker at events, college campuses across the country, focusing on common sense steps to take to control and combat her generation's embrace of socialism. By the way, she's a proud, proud gun owner. Like I said, she supports the term limits and her major in college, to give her a little bit more credibility for all of what she's doing, was, among other things, economics. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say I just met her, but I'm glad I'm introducing her. Morgan, come on up. So I'm really happy to be at the Conservative Party event. I think that our values really align. And so I'm happy to be here to talk about the ways I think the Conservative Party can take my message and move it forward with uh, your policy, your platform, and the ways you reach my generation for the years to come. So uh, I want to talk to you about a few things today. I'll keep it fun. I love to use socialists in their own words because it's the clearest form of communication and it, you can believe me all you want or you can not believe me, but when they say it and when the words are coming out of their mouth, that's when you really know uh, where their values lie and that's in socialism. So first I want to tell you a little lesson I learned about my communist roommate and, uh, and then I will tell you what socialism is because there's a lot of confusion about what socialism is versus what democratic socialism is, what Nordic European economics is, and uh, we're going to set the facts straight there. The second, or the third, um, defining our enemy. Who is the enemy in the fight against socialism, in the fight against my generation specifically embracing such a deadly ideology? Uh, then I have three topics. I've done a lot of research on the three ways that all socialist movements throughout history have really made an effort to get the population to support such radical ideas and how those tactics in previous countries and previous movements really are emulated in the American left's movement today to get my generation to embrace socialism. And finally, I will give you a plea and I will ask you to include realistic solutions to my generation's top issues including protecting the environment, finding solutions for the student loan crisis, and finding affordable health care. Um, because those are the issues my generation really cares about, and I think when we left a void, uh, when we left a vacuum 
by not providing realistic solutions or providing any, any solutions at all, it allowed the far left to fill that vacuum quite quickly with socialist policies. So, I'm from upstate New York, and I speak all over the country, and I've never spoken about this in upstate New York. This is my first time, so thank you for having me. I'm uh, from Washington County, I was from Saratoga County, and as he mentioned earlier, I ran for state assembly, so thank you for endorsing me. I was the Conservative Party candidate, and I appreciate everybody's help uh, throughout the campaign in this room. Um, I have a Zegers Freedom Flags, it's a woodworking business where I make wooden American flags. I hunt and fish on the weekends. My dad is a colonel in the U.S. Army. He served in Operation Iraqi Freedom and during 9-11, uh, the day after he was called down to serve. So I'm very patriotic. I love what our country stands for and uh, clearly I love upstate New York. So my values, I think you can see who I am as an individual. And I, I tell you this, and I show you these pictures to really set the stage for the experience I had when I went to college. I went to American University in Washington, D.C. And, oh boy, I, I thought I was going to a very patriotic place because I love upstate New York and I love America. And to go to American University, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. It's going to be so awesome to be in my nation's capital and advocate for veterans and do all the fun things. But uh, it wasn't that. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, American is 90% liberal, if anybody knows of American. We're also the number one most politically active campus in the country. So again, very different from upstate New York. I had a lot of instances in the classroom that you read about and see on the news. Uh, Campus Reform is a really great conservative organization that calls out professors who are radical uh, in their teachings. But I had one professor who said Republicans in the South only vote Republican because of one, immigrants are down by the southern border, we don't like them, and two, race. And then he moved on to the next lesson. That was the lesson that my professor had taught an entire classroom of students, and I was really disgusted. Uh, another time we had Black Lives Matter. The group on campus was called The Darkening, and they wanted a safe space of people of color only, and they only wanted to let these people of color into a cafe, a segregated cafe, they wanted a segregated cafe on campus, and to get this, they decided to block the entrance and exits of the only main parking garage on campus at the end of the day. So when people were either leaving and trying to get home to their families, or when people were getting there after a long days of work, day of work, and they were just trying to get to their night class. So they decided to block the exits and exit until they got a segregated cafe on campus. Really great stuff, um, and of course, American University, if I can describe it in one picture, they burned the flag when President Trump won on election day. Um, I'm glad I was at Congresswoman Stefanik's victory campaign party and not on that campus because I probably would have gone berserk. But American University, a lot of interesting experiences, but my weirdest experience really talked them all when I moved off campus into a house with some girls at the, my last year of college. I, I knew some of the girls, but I didn't know some of the others, and so I went around in my room and I introduced myself to these new ladies. And one of them was very nice, and we're getting along, and we're talking, and you know, we're really hitting it off, but I was getting a little distracted because I saw something on the wall behind her, and I'm like, talking to her like, oh yeah, okay, okay. And then I'm looking at the wall, and then I'm looking back at her, and I'm looking at the wall, and I realized, oh my gosh, uh, this was the poster on her wall. And you, you guys know those guys? Um, I took me a minute, but I, I looked at the wall and I was like, wow, I have really only seen these people in a black and white documentary on the History Channel or in a textbook, in a black and white picture in my history textbook in high school. It's Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx, and Fidel Castro. Uh -huh. And so I looked at my roommate again and I'm like, huh, what, what's that? What is that? And, and she looked at me with the biggest smile on her face and she said, oh, I'm a communist. Yeah. I didn't say anything for a little bit because it, it was a lot to digest. These are mass murderers and dictators holding fruity cocktail drinks and wearing party hats. And it was on the wall of my communist roommate who has been through the entire US education system and for some reason, believed that communism would best help people that were poor and struggling in the United States of America. So I'm here today because I really am concerned. About November 2018, I saw a poll from Gallup that said 58%, a majority, it's official, would choose socialism 
over capitalism for the future of my uh, for the future of the country. Fifty eight percent of people my age, and it was really disgusting to me. Um, but then I also saw victims of communism came out with a poll and said that one in three millennials view communism favorably. It said seventy percent of people my age would vote for a socialist. One in five believe life would be better off in America if there was no private property. And 43% believe that the Communist Manifesto better guarantees freedom and equality more so than the Declaration of Independence. And I, I saw these numbers and I took to heart the lesson that I got from my roommate. She taught me two things. First of all, she said that Republicans and conservatives were mean. Mean was her word because we didn't put taxpayer dollars and government action behind the things we care about. And to me, that says that conservatives and Republicans were not messaging our vision for the future of the country correctly if my generation sees being mean or caring about something as how much government force, how many taxpayer dollars you can put behind something you care about. And again, a poster of mass murderers and dictators on her wall, but no, the Republicans are mean. So that was lesson number one, but lesson number two was the fact that this girl was one of the nicest girls I've ever met. A commie, I've never met a commie before, and she didn't have one of those like furrowed mustaches, and, and she didn't look like Joseph Stalin or any of the USSR guys that you see in the textbook. She was blonde, blue-eyed, she looked the classic American college girl just hanging out, living her life, and then supporting communism. And she really had the best of intentions. And I, I take that because we are not a generation that supports seizing the means of production, and that's what I'll get into next. Socialism is when you seize the means of production and have the government control the means of production. It says 70% of people my age would vote for a socialist, but do 70% of people my age want to seize the means of production, or do they even know what seizing the means of production is? No, they don't. They do not at all. So the future looks really bright with this. It's just a, a conflict of messaging. Uh, the equation in this situation is the fact that we're ignorant, we were failed in the classroom, and we have the best of intentions. And the combination of those two things, like it's like softball or t-ball, like we're perfectly teed up to just be taken advantage of by the far left, and that's what's happening here. So when I say we were failed in the, the classroom, I hope anybody in education policy or anybody who cares about what their students are learning about and their kids are learning about in the classroom I don't think the issue is that we weren't taught about these men, because most people my age know who Joseph Stalin was, know about the USSR, know about Fidel Castro. It's just a matter of what we were taught and the connections that were made between ideology and action. So instead of being taught that Fidel Castro, Lenin, Stalin, it, instead of being taught that these men promised a lot of really great free things, and promise a more fair and equal and moral society if only we just implement their socialist policies. But they implemented the socialism and it failed the economy and it failed the country and it led to a dictatorship of people starving and dying. We weren't really taught that. Instead, we were taught that those men are bad. They came to power because they wanted power. They starved their people because they were bad dictators. And that's that. They were just really bad guys who got power. The connection between socialism, the false promises, the utopian promises of socialism was not made properly in the classroom to connect the ideology with the actions of these men. And I think that's where we were failed in the classroom. So again, it's a combination of ignorance and good intentions that allows our generation to be completely taken advantage of by the far left. What is socialism? Let's read the definition. This is funny. I post pictures and videos of the definition of socialism online from the dictionary, and I still have socialists contradicting me in the comments saying, that's not socialism. That's not real socialism. I don't know what these people want anymore, and that's a tactic I'll talk about later. The socialists have to distort language, and they have to distort uh, the rhetoric and the narrative in order to control the narrative. Um, the definition of socialism Basically, to wrap it up, a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state, or a stage of society in Marxist theory between capitalism and communism. So, when you hear Bernie Sanders in 2019 go on MSNBC's town hall and tell us 
when he's talking about democratic socialism, he's not looking at Venezuela. He's not looking at Cuba. He's looking at Nordic Europe, places like Denmark and Sweden. Do I believe that guy? No, I do not. Because Nordic Europe relies on capitalism, private entities doing business. Venezuela and Cuba, the countries he has been praising for decades, are socialist. So I don't really trust the man for all of a sudden flipping his ideology and promising our generation that if we scrap capitalism, we'll end up like Nordic Europe. It's the biggest lie that everybody in this room should be aware of, and it's what young people in your life will use to justify why they support him and why they support socialism. So I hope you take that with you when you leave this place. Like I said, Venezuela versus Sweden and Denmark. Venezuela seized the means of production, same with Cuba, same with the USSR. They had government-controlled industries. Major parts of the economy were controlled by the government. But in Nordic Europe, yes, they have high taxes. Yes, they have big government programs. But it's important to distinguish for my generation when we're talking to them that they have a capitalist society and they rely on capitalism to create the wealth to pay for the big programs. And the fact that they're struggling to pay for those big programs is a separate topic, and I would love to get into that, but I'm not gonna. Um, but it's important to make that distinct, uh, it's important to distinguish the two. If you could play this, brother. Do you know how to make the volume work? Where's the AV guy? <laughs> so, I don't know if the video might not work, but basically this was Bernie Sanders in 1980 saying his version of the United States, if he had his say, would require major parts of the U.S. economy being controlled by the government. Socialism. This clip, another 1980s clip, has anybody seen this one? Does it look familiar? This is Bernie Sanders in 1980 saying he was just so happy. He remembers being just so happy as a boy when he saw Fidel Castro come to power because it just felt so right to see the poor people rise up against the ugly rich people. Quote, the ugly rich people. This is Bernie Sanders in 1980. Uh, this one, I don't know if you guys have seen this. I've seen all these videos, so they look very familiar to me, so sorry. This is Bernie Sanders saying, you know, a lot of journalists will say that a country is bad if it has bread lines, as if people lining up for food is a bad thing. That's a good thing. In other countries, the rich get the food and the poor starve to death. So there he is praising bread lines because it's better to have people wait for food and government bread lines than to have the poor people starve to death, which apparently they do in the United States. But here's another thing to bring up to the young people in your life. We have a lot of government programs to protect people. We put a lot of government resources into providing unemployment benefits if you lose your job on accident and it wasn't your fault and you need a hand up. In society, you need three months of pay to help you provide for your family and stay off the streets. We will give that to you because we're a generous and caring society. And I'm proud, like you guys are, I'm sure, to pay my taxes and to help people who are struggling and to help them move back up into the station that they started in in life because they deserve that. I want to help people. And when you talk to young people, Make sure they are aware of this. Make sure they are aware that we have Fair Labor and Standards Act, that we have uh, Occupational Safety and Hazards Administration, ways that we protect consumers and workers and people in the lower classes of the United States through government action with capitalism, the combination. So you would see those 1980s clips, and I wish I could play them for you because they're so good to see them coming out of his mouth. But um, you see these older clips, and a lot of people will say, well, that was him in the 1980s. That was him back then. People change, right? Um, not really. And the guy honeymooned in the USSR on top of it all, which is really crazy. And he also, for those of you familiar with the Sandinistas in the Nicaragua, he went to Nicaragua, trained with Daniel Ortega in the forest, with the Sandinistas, and then came back to the United States and praised Ortega as a great leader. Again, another socialist dictator who has killed innocent people in his country and caused so much devastation. So, Bernie Sanders, this is a quote from Bernie 
Sanders website in 2011. I don't know if you guys can read it, but it says, the American dream is more apt to be realized in Venezuela. In 2011, what has happened in Venezuela since then? And Bernie Sanders has still not denounced it, and he insists that his socialism would not make us like Venezuela. But then he contradicts himself again, because this is a, a tweet from October 27th, 2019. It says, it's time to begin thinking about public ownership of major utilities. I think I've made it very clear what socialism is versus what capitalism is with a conscientious government. Socialism is state controlling major portions of the US economy. It's a lie to say that Bernie Sanders policies like this would result in more Europe. We know what socialism is, we know what the problem is, but how do we fight this? How do we fight the fact that my generation, now a majority of people my age, support socialism for the future of the country? Because if we don't fight it accurately and efficiently, we are screwed, and I am confident when I say that. Has anybody read The Art of War? Anybody in this room? Can I get a little hand raise? Um, one of the major themes is defining your enemy. So who is the enemy in this? Is the enemy people my age who think they support socialism? It is not. And so I get a little frustrated, and I've done this myself, so I'm not going to act like I'm pure in this, but it's a little frustrating when I see people on the conservative and Republican sides making fun of people my age for supporting socialism. Because yes, I have a crazy commie roommate, and no, not everybody's like her. A majority of people have no idea what socialism, Marxism, communism, they have no idea what any of those things are. They have no idea what it even means to have the government control an industry versus what capitalism and private uh, market business really are at all. They have no idea about these things. And so this is not a, a situation of fighting the millennials and Gen Z who support socialism. This is about equipping them with the truth about socialism so they do not get taken advantage of because I'm embarrassed by my generation's support of this. It's embarrassing at this point. Socialism is an absolute failure, a historic failure. And for some reason, because the left uses emotion and says they're going to bring fairness and morality and equality and all the good things to our country through socialism and they're going to save the world from dying from climate change because of socialism, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned. So, I think the enemy here is Bernie Sanders and the far left leaders who know exactly what they're doing when they tell my generation that capitalism is bad and if you scrap capitalism you'll end up like Nordic Europe. It's a lie. And that's our real enemy here. So I ask everybody in this room, please don't make fun of the young people. I've done it. I've done it a lot. And I've said, oh, stupid millennials with their avocado toast and they're tweeting on their $1,000 iPhones about how they hate capitalism. It's so hypocritical, blah, blah, blah. I've, I've done it before. But I'm asking people in this room to take a more, um, a more appreciative tone with them because they want to help people. Oh, sorry. So I, I just ask everybody in the crowd to, to take a, a nicer tone when you're talking to young people because think of my communist roommate. She wants to help people and she wants to help the people that are struggling and she wants to solve the problems. So if we provide them with realistic solutions that will actually bring real results for the American people, we could win this. We really could. Because the left has emotion on their side and that's how they use it to win over every single argument. But we have logic, statistics, economics, facts and emotion on our side because people have literally put their lives on the line by sailing over on a raft from a socialist country just to reach the land of the free, the United States of America. How come we don't tell those stories? How come we don't take that emotion and use it to our advantage the way the left does? I'm sick of that. And so that's what my, my nonprofit in Americans Against Socialism, we film the stories of people who have lived through socialism, who have put their lives on the line to come here, and then we ask them questions about what it was like to live in socialism versus capitalism. And we put them on social media, but I'm not gonna talk about that too much. So has anybody heard of Project Veritas, James O'Keefe? He's great, right? Um, so a few, a few months ago or so, I spoke on a panel with him in New Orleans, um, and afterwards, we spoke about what I was doing with Young Americans Against Socialism and what he does. And he suggested, you know, you really have to catch these people that you define as the enemy. You have to catch them saying what they would say in private that they wouldn't say in public. And he asked me, if you could catch them saying something that would help you expose them for what they are, what, what would you want them to say? And I said, well, I would want them to admit that they are socialists 
and they are not democratic socialists. That democratic socialism is just a facade. I said I would want them to admit that they support violence in order to get their policies implemented. And I also would love if we could get them to admit that they would get violent if they lose the next election, because I think they will. Antifa is on the side of the left, and they have already been causing and wreaking havoc in our communities just because they're not happy with the results of a political election. So he said, well, stay tuned because we're going to cover 2020, so maybe we'll get some information. And flash forward, I don't know if you guys saw two weeks ago, Project Veritas released clips, and the, the sound is off, but um, in the clips, they have multiple Bernie staffers uh, admitting that they believe Bernie is a true socialist, a true radical, that would take us beyond anything in Nordic Europe, and that he's just masquerading as a democratic socialist. And I, will, I wish I could show you these, these clips, but what's so concerning is that the Bernie Sanders campaign is hiding, and they are not firing these staffers. They've said some really crazy stuff, and I'll show you throughout the presentation, but just keep in mind, the Bernie Sanders staff campaign is standing by these staffers who have called for Republicans to go to re-education camps, who have called for gulags, for billionaires, for billionaires to break rocks for 12 hours a day to really get them to learn what it's like to be working class. They say they're going to burn cities. Cities will burn if Bernie does not get the nomination. They say police will be beaten if Trump wins, that police will be the ones getting beaten. But what's funny is last week, the Bernie Sanders campaign called the police on journalists and had the police deliver the message to the journalists. Instead of giving a comment, they had the police give the comment that said the Bernie Sanders staff will be standing by the staffers that were caught undercover on video, and they just wish that they hadn't said that, and that's all they're gonna say about that. So this is the clip, again, Bernie's masquerading as a democratic socialist, but he's really a commie. Now I wanna talk about the tactics of the left. Like I said, I've done a lot of research, I've done a lot of um, kind of investigation into the different tactics used by socialist movements throughout history and how they are mimicked by the American left today in, in terms of how they use tactics to reach my generation specifically. The first one, they have to control the language, to control the narrative. The second, they have to create the, the desire for forced wealth redistribution because that's not a natural human desire. You have to really sow the seeds of that person has something that I don't have and I'm gonna use force to take it from them. And you need to instill that in the people before your socialist movement really takes flight. Uh, the third is they need to create a sense of fear and urgency. And they really have done that very well. Has anybody read The Road to Serfdom? I, I, I hope everybody does. It's a short book, you guys. Everybody get that book after this. Um, Hayek talks about socials throughout history changing the meanings of words that we always use as a society. So what it means to be moral, what it means to be fair, what it means to have equality. And I, oh, I wish I had my videos. Um, Bernie Sanders has recently been changing the definition of freedom, and it really fits perfectly with the predictions of Hayek in terms of how a socialist will change the meanings of basic words. So this video is not going to play, but it basically says, what is freedom? And then it's a bunch of young people that say, am I free if I have student loan debt? Am I free if I have high health care costs? Am I free if I only work my dead-end job? to get health care insurance. <clears throat> yes, I hate to break it to you, those are crappy situations in many ways, and we can maybe work together, bipartisan, to find solutions for these issues, but I hate to break it to you guys, you are free in all of the situations that you listed out. Unfortunately, does the video say that at the end? Does it say, yes, you're free? It does not. The video ends with, no, you're not free. Freedom comes from economic freedom, and economic freedom comes from Medicare for All, from student loan forgiveness, from the Green New Deal. And then it says, freedom is Medicare for All. Freedom is the Green New Deal. Freedom is free college and student loan cancellation. Literally changing what freedom means, so that freedom is no longer freedom to live your life and freedom to not be oppressed by a government, it is now freedom from the responsibility of having tough times in your life and instead having the government take over those burdens by just controlling almost every aspect of your being. That's not freedom. 
similar to controlling the language, distorting the language. Does anybody, I know everybody knows about the Green New Deal, but what about the just society? Has anybody heard of that? Weird, right? Because everybody knows about the Green New Deal. And what happened is AOC released a, I think it's five bills, one resolution, a package called Just Society, and she did at the same time the story about impeachment growth. And so it kind of missed the news cycle, but I tell everybody about it because it's important to keep an eye on. Um, I just want to point out the distortion of language that she uses in three of these bills, the Embrace Act. I love hugs. I love embracing. But is the Embrace Act about hugs? No. The Embrace Act would qualify all illegal immigrants in the United States to every, every benefit, every program, every, to receive everything that a U.S. citizen would also be able to receive in terms of welfare benefits, etc. That's the Embrace Act. Uh, a Place to Prosper Act. I always make this joke and no one laughs, but I always say it just for fun. Um, Place to Prosper is national rent control. And for all the economists in the room, national rent control, the long-term result is homelessness. And so is the street really a place to prosper? No, it's not. Um, I have to say that every time. Um, Uplift Our Workers Act. What is Uplift Our Workers Act? Because I'm going to do that. I think we do that pretty well as a country, but Uplift Our Workers Act would actually make it so that the Department of Labor gives out government contracts based on how well that private business complies with the left's radical agenda. That they can't pass through Congress and turn into legislation, so instead they just have you know guidance on, on what's moral for a business to do, like how many weeks they have of paid family leave, how much they pay their employees, etc. So instead of handing out government contracts based on how efficient a business is going to be with their use of taxpayer dollars, they want to have it handed out based on how well a business complies with the radical agenda of the left. That is Uplift Our Workers Act. So the second tactic they use is creating the need for wealth redistribution, the desire among the people, starting a class war. And that's what they're doing. I don't know if you guys notice this with the language that they use, with the way they talk about millionaires and billionaires, but uh, it's pretty bad. And I, I think what's crazy about this is it, you can trace back different socialist movements that have done the same thing and how they've done it and what they use to really pull at the, the heartstrings of the people and it's very similar to today. Uh, so this is AOC. I don't know if anybody. Oh, Ricky. It's okay. Um, so basically, this is a video of AOC saying that in order to be an ethical billionaire today, you have to give your power to her. She wants your power, and oh, she doesn't want it for her. She wants it for the people. It's for the people. And well, that sounds like every other socialist that's come to power by saying, give me the power and I'll make your life better, I promise, just trust me. Um, it's, it's very similar. And so this is her saying that it's not possible to be a moral billionaire. And uh, it's, it's just crazy. So then this is another video where she says, that this one got all over the news, it was on Fox, where she says that you can never earn a billion dollars, you can only take a billion dollars. Because the widgets that these companies are making, the products that they are making, are not made by the billionaires that sit on a couch as the workers actually create the product. That billionaire sits on a couch as he pays slave wages to the workers, and then she decides to add identity politics into it and says, so he's taking advantage by paying slave wages, modern day slave wages to his workers, and it's especially affecting black and brown people and, and pregnant women. She's just throwing out ridiculous leftist jargon and it's not adding up. And it's just crazy to me because, again, it's in step with every socialist movement where they have to create a frustration with the people who are in the working class and the people who apparently now just sit on a couch and take a billion dollars. And she has an economics degree. Um, so, uh, again, this is a Project Veritas clip. Uh, I wish I could show it to you, but basically they're talking about how they want to send billionaires to re-education camps and gulags because the USSR gulags weren't that bad. And to really teach a billionaire and break a billionaire, you have to send him to break rocks for 12 hours a day at a gulag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is really working, this tactic, but, but I think what makes this the most effective is the student loan crisis. Um, back when Che Guevara, great guy, 
and Fidel Castro. <laughs> Back when those guys were coming to power in Cuba, they, I don't know who knows this in the crowd, but they, they landed on the shores of Cuba. They had a first initial battle with Batista, and a bunch of them were killed. So they were left with like numbers in the teens. And they had to build ranks again. And so they went on their way to Havana to these little like, peasant towns along the way. And they would go to the peasants in town, and they'd say, hey guys, I have a little something for you. And they would say, you see those rich people down the road, those landowners, with all that money, all those resources, all that land, all those animals? We just took those animals from them, and we're going to give them to you, because it, it's fair. It's not fair they have all those things that you don't have. And we used force to take it from them, and we're going to give them to you, because that's what you deserve, that's fair, that's moral. And if you join us, if you support us, this is just a little taste of what it's going to be like, so please join our movement. Well, we don't really barter with land animals anymore in 2020, but the 2020 version of that I see as the student loan crisis, where you have a ton of students. I, I had a, an advertising job after I got out of college, and I was sitting with girls we had this like open concept office, and so I could hear everybody talking, and they're not political girls at all, but they were talking about Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders because they were willing to cancel their student loan debt. These girls were paying upwards of $600, $700, $800 a month, the same as their rent, because they, the high school guidance counseling system, the college system that we have right now, which is failing, forced them through and made it seem like the right thing was to just go to a classic four-year liberal arts school, get a worthless degree, and then pay thousands of dollars a month for decades to come on this, on this student loan. And so they aren't political, but they see Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren promising this great thing of canceling student loan debt, and they're like, okay. And so you can go on Elizabeth Warren's website, and it will literally say, type in, student loans that you owe right now, and we'll tell you how much will be taken off if you elect Liz Warren, vote for Liz. And so I did it, I put $100,000, I don't have $100,000 a month, but I put $100,000 and it said $50,000 will be taken off if I elected Liz Warren president. It's that same idea, and so you hear Bernie Sanders saying, we're gonna tax the rich, we're gonna tax Wall Street, and we're gonna use it to pay to cancel student loans. That's a literal tweet from him. Tax the rich and cancel student loans. It's a shorter, modernized version of those rich people over there have what you don't have and we will use government force to take it from them because it's not fair. We will solve your problem using government force. You just have to support that idea. And it's working because these numbers, 70% of young Americans believe the wealth distribution in this country is unfair. 53% of young Americans support redistributing the wealth redistributing, and, and redistributing doesn't happen without force. Uh, fear and urgency. Um, the left, all socialist movements, have to create a sense of fear and urgency to come to power and to really rile up the people to support such radical ideas. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of 1891, there was a famine in Russia, it was very bad. Uh, there aren't really accurate, uh, there aren't accurate numbers on how bad it was. People say that 300,000 to 5 million people could have died in this. And Vladimir Lenin, at the time, was a very wealthy little boy, very wealthy young man, and he really, really wants to be remembered as a man of the people, as a working class man, you know, but he wasn't. He was from a very well-educated, well-to-do, wealthy family. And he is on record saying that he did not do a single thing during the famine of 1891 in his country, in his community, to help people from starving in the streets, even though he had plenty of money and resources, because he knew that it, things had to get very bad in his community and country and in the minds of the people before they would be willing to support such a radical idea like his desire for socialism and communism. Things had to get bad before people would be willing to support such radical ideas. So now we have climate change. And I want to preface this, I am very much into energy policy and environmental policy. And I think as a capitalist, finding ways to be more energy efficient and uh, better with our use of single-use plastics and better to our planet as a whole is an incredibly capitalist ideal. And it is something as an entrepreneur, as a capitalist, as a conservative, I want to be as good as possible to our environment and I love that technology and innovation and capitalism is bringing us to even more solutions. So I don't think environmentalism is a hoax or anything like that. I just think there are better ways to go about it, and the world's not ending in 12 years. 
So this is the video of AOC saying that the world's ending in 12 years and all people want to focus on is, is 12 years. Republicans don't want to act. How dare they? And we need the Green New Deal. That's why we need to act fast. So what happens when you have people like AOC on the national stage of American politics talking with that kind of rhetoric, saying the world is going to end? Because here's the problem. I don't know if anybody knows this. I'm like kind of spitballing here. AOC's chief of staff, who helped her write the Green New Deal, is on record admitting, and not even like a accidentally, he just says it. He says, we wrote the Green New Deal as an economic agenda to restructure the United States from capitalist to socialist. And then later on, we slapped a sticker on it that said climate change. So that's on record. That's official. Climate change did not cause the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal started as an economic way to change the United States into socialist, into a socialist country from a capitalist country. And then they added the climate change sticker and label to the package. But when you have a national figure like AOC talking like that, it leads to more public figures, more cultural figures like Greta, who come into the picture and say, how dare you not support the Green New Deal? People are suffering, ecosystems are collapsing, and people are dying. That's the really tricky one. People are dying. But are people dying? Because there's two studies that we need to point out to young people. The UN had a study that said that the overall impact of climate change by the year 2070 is going to equate to about a, a 0 0.02 to a 0 0.2 loss of income worldwide by the year 2070, and that's including ecosystems. So is the world ending in 12 years? No. But another study, are people dying? No, because in the last 100 years, the number of people who have died and who are currently dying due to natural disasters and extreme weather has decreased by 90% because of innovative technology, because of capitalist solutions, because we're advancing as a society thanks to capitalism. People are still dying, yes, but the numbers are dramatically lower in the last 100 years, and we need to be thankful for that, and of course find even better solutions, like us conservatives always do, to help save those last people that we need to lift up. So when you have Greta, the public figure, who's not necessarily political, and you have AOC and all the Green New Deal Dems and the presidential candidates all saying the world's gonna end in 12 years, that results in this video, which I could show you if I, I wish I could, but um, it's a video of a dad and a young girl, and he's got his arm around her like this, and they're at a climate rally a few months ago, and the girl is asked, why are you here? And she says, well, my dad says, we might not be alive in a few years, and so I'm here to help protect the planet. We're, we might not be alive in a few years. A few years. That's child abuse. I don't know if you guys agree with me on that. I think it's child abuse. You should have a child and then bring them up in a world feeling safe and secure and confident that they're not going to die in three years if Republicans and the evil conservatives don't act on the Green New Deal. That started as a socialist economic transition for the United States. And this is where it really gets bad. Um, you know those climate change rallies that have been happening? They do these like Friday things. Jane Fonda gets arrested at them every Friday. Mark Ruffalo recently got praised at one because he's wearing the one suit to all like six award shows this year. Bravo. Um, really acting very vigorously. Um, so this is what happens when you have such such language and such radical policy proposals around climate change. These climate rallies are being infiltrated, and these are just some of the posters. I literally just Googled climate change rallies in the US on this date a few weeks ago, whatever, whenever I made this. And throughout the pictures, these were hidden amongst them. Capitalism is the crisis. So of course there was little girls holding like a picture of the planet Earth. And there was ones that say like, protect Mother Earth, and be good to the planet, and recycle. But these posters were hidden throughout the pictures. Capitalism is the crisis. High school students see our future sold. Capitalism kills. Revolution is our only hope. And then capitalism destroys the planet. We need revolution, nothing less. 
the socialist and communist movements have really used climate change to infiltrate uh, average politics, mainstream politics, and, and the fact that socialism is now mainstream is sickening to me. But here's where it gets even worse, because now capitalism and, and really modernizing and main, making socialism mainstream is infiltrating the other issues, too. So who knows Che Guevara? Anybody know that guy? Again, great guy. His nickname was The Butcher, because he is a horrible man. Uh, he killed LGBTQ people specifically because he just thought they couldn't properly contribute to the revolution. They weren't proper revolutionaries because they were inhibited by their gayness. Um, and so this is what's just golden. You have the close the camps rallies. And again, Che Guevara ran Castro's number one killing camp and prison for all the political um, prisoners that they had who were against the communist rank revolution in Cuba, Che Guevara ran the camp. But because the left says that the concentration camps on our border, aka border patrols buildings, are concentration camps, they had close the camps rallies. And if you look, you can't really see, but these pink posters, like eh, above the clothes on that one, it's a pink poster. That's Che Guevara. Ha, right? Crazy? At a close the camps rally, Che Guevara's face is being held by a bunch of high school students who skip school to close the camps, but they're holding the face of a man who ran a killing camp in Cuba. The butcher. So, not adding up here. Um, and then this one at the top, this is Che Guevara's face at an LGBTQ pride parade. Again, he killed those people because he didn't think they could properly contribute to the revolution. Killed them. And then again, there he is, and another one of the clothes that can't Great. So, I guess to wrap it up here, I'm sorry if I went over, I'm not even sure how long this has been, <laughs> but, very good? Um, again, I wish I could show you these Project Veritas clips, but this is the staffer saying, there are so many of us in the Bernie Sanders campaign. And he says, what's most troubling, it carries in that, that aspect of creating fear and urgency around climate change in order to get this socialist radical agenda implemented. Here he says, communism is all about protecting people and planet. And our communist revolution is no different than the revolutions throughout history. It, if you are against the revolution, you deserve to expect a violent reaction. Again, he ties communism to planet and people, says that to act in urgency for climate change, you need to act with urgency for the Green New Deal and socialism and Bernie Sanders' agenda, and that if you are against this revolution, you should expect a violent effing reaction. And then he goes to justify it by saying, you know, people say Che Guevara and Fidel Castro were that bad because they also had these atrocities where they killed the anti-revolutionaries, the people that were against their movement. Well, I mean, if you're against the movement, then you've got to get out of the way. And if we have to exterminate people, then that's what we'll have to do. And just a reminder, Bernie Sanders' campaign, they sent police to journalists who wanted to comment on this story, and they had the police tell them, we are standing by these employees, they will not be fired. So this, this clip is the, the second Project Veritas clip about climate change. This staffer decides to say that to really get this agenda implemented, we need to have the House of Representatives dissolve, the Senate dissolve, state governments dissolve, and instead just have Bernie Sanders and his hand-picked cabinet run the government. Because that's the most effective way to really get to climate change and save the planet really quick. We need to act quick and we need to dissolve the U.S. government and have Bernie Sanders run a dictatorship. And again, he still works for the Bernie Sanders campaign as a paid staffer, and they're standing by him, and he's still gonna work with them for the near future. So, sorry if I went on a little rant there, but it's really frustrating to me that my generation is being taken advantage of and lied to. So it's up to all of us to communicate with the young people in our lives that conservatives, have proper solutions for the student loan crisis, that people earn money without taking it, they can earn it in an ethical way in this country, that's the beauty of business and capitalism, 
and that the world is not ending in 12 years, and conservatives have some of the best solutions to protecting our environment that we've seen. We have carbon offsetting, we have carbon capture technology, we have nuclear energy and nuclear power. We have a lot of ways that we can properly fix these problems, but I think as a party and a movement, we're not effectively messaging it to young people. So I hope that as, as a party and, and as a, a conservative movement, we can work together to find and message these, these pieces of information to people my age in a better way, to show them the beauty of business, how moral capitalism is compared to uh, the failure that socialism really is. And so I just have one ask. If anybody knows people who have lived through socialism in the crowd, that would be interested in doing a video with Young Americans Against Socialism. We've gotten a million views on a video in 24 hours. We had uh, over 45 million impressions on our videos in two months. We've really been working hard on this. We've been on for six months, but we've gotten some serious numbers. We have over 110,000 followers, and we just want to use that platform that we've been blessed with to propel the story. So if you have lived through socialism, if you know somebody, or if you have a business and you're interested in talking about that aspect of building a business up, or if you have your own American dream, it's all about telling your personal story and, and relaying that to my generation. Um, our website is fightsocialism.org. That's where you see all of our emails and everything. Um, and then you can also submit that you have a story that you'd like to tell. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I don't know if there's time for questions, but I really appreciate uh, the time for you guys to listen and hear me out. Thank you.